Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Playing With Perspective, the Suspend and Animation podcast. Now, I've got a fantastic show for you today. I am super excited. I've got Daniel Tolson here in the house, and he's going to show us how to win sales now in less than 30 minutes a day. Now, who is Daniel? Daniel is a former Australian champion athlete. He serves as a consultant to publicly listed and privately owned billion dollar businesses and has personally helped his clients increase their revenues by more than $100 million. Today, he's going to show us how to double your sales results in less than 30 minutes a day so you can win more sales faster and easier than you ever thought possible. So everybody, please put your hands together and welcome our good friend, Daniel Tolson. Aaron, thanks for, thanks for having me here. It's a, it's a true pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. I'm super excited. I think this is going to be a really, really interesting episode. And I'm going to be learning lots of stuff that I'm going to be putting into place. So um, I thought maybe just before we kick off with some questions, give us a little snapshot of your journey and, you know, who you are and, you know, then we'll take it a bit further. Well, I think the, the thing that uh, I always remind myself that I am a champion and I'm a winner. <laughs> Because I, I am the sperm that got the egg. <laughs> when I came into this life, um, there was millions of competitors and I beat them all. I got the egg. Awesome. And, and I think sport, sometimes... Which sport was it that you played? Uh, I, I was in wakeboarding. And so wakeboarding uh, was in my blood. My father was a champion barefooter. So from the age of four, we were down on the river uh, on the weekends water skiing. Fantastic. I love it. So it's been in the blood for a long time. Wow, fantastic. And then what brought you into doing what you do now? I'd, I'd been water skiing for a long time. And then at, at about age 13 or 14, I started to wakeboard. And by the age of 16, I noticed that I had a very unique skill. And I would go and ride with people who were riding, had been riding longer than me. However, they couldn't perform certain tricks. And I was able to break the tricks down and coach them on how to do these tricks even though I couldn't do the trick myself. Wow. And so what I found myself doing would be after school on the weekends, I'd watch these wakeboarding videos. And back then they were on VHS yeah. and I'd press play and I'd watch the same trick hundreds of times. I'd put it in slow motion yeah. and I'd break it down. And people would say to me, you know, danger, I yeah. want to learn this trick. Can you teach me how to do it? And so I'd go away and I'd study. Now, I couldn't do the trick, but I could tell them everything they needed to do. And these people went on to become Australian champions and even world champion wakeboarders. Really? And so at age 16, uh, some of the top coaches in Australia brought me in to teach water skiers how to wakeboard. So I was earning a couple of hundred dollars an hour when I was uh, 16, coaching wakeboarding and uh, to water skiers. Yeah, and it just uh, grew and grew. So I started my journey. I wanted to become an Australian champion, but I had to come overcome different obstacles to other people. And it took me 10 years to achieve my goal to be an Australian champion wakeboarder. Yeah. But the journey was well worth it. I had to overcome a lot of setbacks, uh, injuries, Epstein-Barr virus, chronic fatigue, oh, uh, multiple knee reconstructions, broken arms, broken noses. Oh. But then I got there. Oh, no. <laughs> And if, I, if there's one or two things that you learned in that journey, in that process, that helps you with what you do now as a business consultant, business coach, anything that you, know, you can highlight? The first one is definitely resiliency. And in the business world today, we're going to throw out our strategic plans every 90 days. Because as we were talking about before, the world changes so fast. There's new technology. We have more competitors coming in at many different angles. And what we think is going to work today is not going to work in 90 days. So we have to have a lot of flexibility. We have to have a lot of resiliency because we're going to have more failures than successes in business. But it's those one or two successes we have that can cancel out hundreds of failures. Definitely. And if we put it in perspective, like a, a Broadway stage show, is uh, nine out of 10 of the stage shows never succeed. But that one in 10 that succeeds uh, returns hundreds of millions of dollars. And we can think of things like um, Phantom of the Opera, yep. Cats, uh, the Elton yep. John show. These ones re we remember and they stick around for 20 and 30 and 40 years. They'll be here long after we go. So we're going to focus on resiliency. We're going to accept failure as part of success. 
And if we can do that, then ultimately we'll be incredibly successful without the stress. I love it. I mean, to me, this is all a game of mindset and you pretty much just summed that up again. Everything is about mindset, how you approach things, your, your attitude, your positivity, your self-awareness. Um, but today we're going to get into a little bit more tactical and strategic uh, um, stuff that you've kind of learned in your journey and things that you consult with, you know, billion dollar businesses about. So I thought maybe it'd be great to start at the top and just kind of give us a little insight into why do you think businesses actually need a coach or a consultant? I work with a very interesting uh, self-made millionaire in the UK. And he said to me once, he said, Daniel, it's not what you know that hurts you. It's what you don't know that hurts you. And we get to a stage in business model innovation where we just can't get any further by ourselves. We've tried all of our strategies. We've tried all of our tactics. We've executed all of our plans. We've done our daily activities and we still don't get the same result. And what happens, you've heard it before, they say, you've got to think outside of the box. And one of my mentors, Edward de Bono, he's been teaching lateral thinking for 40 years. And the problem with thinking outside of the box is you can't think outside of the box from within the box. So for a consultant like myself, they bring me in because I bring a new perspective. And I begin to change their perspectives because I see their business through a totally different lens. So they bring me in. I know nothing about what they've tried. And what happens is I bring them ideas that are working in other industries. And all of a sudden, they start to grow. Because one new idea is enough to double, triple, or even quadruple your sales results. I, mean, I never even thought about that. I mean, it's so simple and so logical. Um, not only do you bring in lots of expertise and experience doing what you do, but you're just another perspective which is already Absolutely. huge. Now, one of the things with uh, perception is, say in Japan, for example, uh, you'll have two, two large corporations. We'll, we'll say, for example, one on this side of the street, which will be Nissan, and the one on the other side of the street will be Subaru. And all of the executives from these two organisations go to the same place for lunch. Right. They sit across each other at lunch. They talk about problems in the industries, challenge they're having in their businesses, and they're friendly. And once they finish work, they go back to their offices and they kill each other corporately. <laughs> but see, what happens is they're actually talking. And what can sharing happen is sharing perspectives. I, I led a team of 17,000 cabin crew for Emirates Airline. There are 126 nationalities who worked within my team. I worked on machines that were worth $450 million. So when I bring these perspectives into another billion dollar business, into a million dollar operation, all of a sudden they're getting new perspective and they're saying, my gosh, we can take that idea, we can implement it over here. And so it's just uh, figuring out what you need from different places and adding it into your business model. And most business models, Darren, you've got to make about four or five improvements to the business model before your sales start to increase. Right. And we've seen over the years, uh, some of our clients, and I think we'll talk a little bit later about case studies, we've seen people increase sales revenues by 250% just on a new perspective, something from outside their industry. Incredible, incredible. And it's sometimes, as you say, it's the little things. Sometimes it's the little things or a, mul or a combination of a few little things done well that can give you huge differences, huge results. Absolutely. I, I learned about a polarizing lens when I first got into photography yep. and uh, I had always been filming a lot of wakeboarding on the water. Uh, we would go up in a helicopter before there were drones and would film out the side of a helicopter and we're always having problems with glare. Right. And then somebody said, why don't you try this polarized lens and everything changed. All of a sudden I could film on days where I was never able to film before. Yeah. And when the sun was high and there was too much glaze and there was too much reflection, all of a sudden that disappeared because we changed the lens. And that was so simple. And I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself. I get, I get too caught up in my own world and I think, oh yeah, I know everything, I've learned everything. Else. But I don't. And as you say, you know, talking to someone else who gives you an outside perspective can change your whole world. So I think that's a really interesting point. Um, uh, on, on, on knowledge and information, the rate of change on the planet today, we're moving faster than any other time in history. And what you and I know today is going to be redundant in two and a half to three years from now. 
what works today won't work two or three years from now. So we have to constantly learn and relearn. And because of the way that the mind works, the mind works in a patterning system. It follows patterns, but we've got to constantly break these patterns. Uh, I, I study my competitors. I go to my competitors' trainings because there's always so much to learn. I was with the Shark Tank here in Taiwan recently and Kevin Harrington was here. And there was one idea that he shared that I thought to myself, bloody hell, why didn't I think of that? Yep. So I'll even go and have a look at what my competitors are doing and then I'll give it to my customers. And this is a really good point for business owners is that people want to buy from you. They like you. Yes. And you can go take an idea from somewhere else and give it to them and they'll appreciate it because they want it from you. They don't want it from the other person. I love that. That's brilliant. I love it. And I mean, to touch on something else you said before, something that I've heard before, and I love the way you put that, is that they say you have to disrupt your own business before someone else does. So if Absolutely. you don't go and do that, you will never know and then it's too late. Yep. We, we get in a comfort zone and I, I specialize in emotional intelligence. I've delivered uh, more than 1,350 case studies in the last four years on emotional intelligence. And there's one key area called motivation. And one of the challenges in business today is that people are stuck in a rut. Yep. They, they hop in their car the morning, in the morning, they come to work the same way. They use the same hand to turn the doorknob every single day. They turn off the alarm with the same code that they've been using for 30 years Absolutely. and they keep doing everything the same. And I learned at a young age, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. Yep. And for me, when I was wakeboarding at age 16, I could do the same trick because it was safe and I wouldn't get hurt. But I had to be willing to get hurt to be able to try something new. And this is where a lot of people never succeeded long-term in the sport. They just did what was easy and fun. They never challenged themselves. And then they were no longer competitive and they could no longer compete. And then they couldn't win trophies. Nobody knew who they were. So true. I mean, it's, so you've got to keep challenging. A lot of it's very logical, but we just have to remind ourselves to actually put all this stuff into practice. It has to become part of our ethos. We, we know it. And then that's that component of emotional intelligence. It's understanding what our fears are. And we fear the future. We fear the unknown. We fear mistakes. We fear rejection. We fear criticism. And those are the things that don't enable us to act on that logic. And then what we happened today, Darren, is we're so bloody smart. And, you know, we've learned NLP and all these things. And we can reframe our own mind. And what I see now is that people who are intelligent are actually becoming dumber. And I saw this with a business person. He said, Daniel, you know what? I've got a fear of rejection, but I've learned to be okay with it. So what he did with his NLP process, he desensitized himself to the fear of rejection and then attributed the feeling of good to it. So he said, I'm okay with it now. It didn't improve his results. His results were stayed the same, but he felt good about rejection. Well, at least it was a good step one. It was, you know, it's the beginning of, of the next it was, phase. It was the beginning, but he got no further because of his intelligence. He was too smart for his own good. Right, I see. Gotcha. So he still didn't put, go out of his comfort zone. Gotcha. Uh, another Olympic athlete that I worked with, uh, this person said to me, Daniel, I, I, don't, um, I don't get anxiety before I go on a, on, into a competition. I said, well, what do you get? And they said, I get excitement. <laughs> See, if you label anxiety excitement, it's still anxiety. Yep. <laughs> and this is why people don't perform because they get really good at changing the vernacular and I the see. words, I but see. they're still stuck in the same place. Yep. They're, still, they're still rationalizing and, and trying to protect themselves. Justification. Justification, exactly. Always, always justifying. And you know that pattern of the mind, if we keep telling ourselves the same story, if we keep justifying it, it becomes our pattern and then eventually it becomes unconscious and we don't even realize why we're doing it. And that's the same as changing perspectives. As a business coach, I come in and I point out these things and this is called the Hawthorne effect. Okay. The Hawthorne effect is one of the greatest breakthroughs in psychology. Mm. And it says that once you observe a behavior, it changes the behavior. Wow. They're just like little things. If you say to this person, your tone went up, at the end of the question versus going down, they'll go, oh my gosh, I never realized I was doing that. And that alone can transform somebody's results in sales. 
So imagine this. If I said to you, Darren, um, you know, thanks for joining me today. I noticed that you love this program. Can we start this Tuesday? (laughs) And the tone goes up and what happens? It sends a different message. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. Can we start this Tuesday? Versus can we start this Tuesday? Absolutely. And again, that that, that goes into um, what we call, um, there's a great term for it, not not verbal communication, it's called uh, sub-communication. Yeah, it's all the unconscious stuff. So, you know, little things like this with the Hawthorne effect, identifying the tone that goes up or the tone that goes down, immediately it's back into the conscious awareness and they can focus on using that strategy. And, you know, things like tone, Jordan Belfort, whether you like him or not, whether you've seen his movie or not, he's excellent at tone. And 38% of our communication is our tone. Mm -hmm. However, with the way we're doing business now is if we're doing business via the telephone, people can't see us. So tone becomes almost 100%. You know, words are still about 7%. So tones becomes about 93%. Because that's the only that perception we have. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, these no, these no. little things. These little, it's it's all those little things. We could I could go on forever just about this, but I just want to get your um, input on some. Um, what are the common pitfalls and issues that most businesses you see? Um, what are they experiencing when it comes to lack of sales? There's there's three big ones. And it happens in every single business. And again, whether people realize it or not, it's happening. The first one is that 80% of the population don't even know that you exist. That's, that's the first problem. The second problem is credibility. Yep. You know, it, today it takes credibility to get the appointment, but it takes mega credibility to get the sale. And the third thing is our lack of knowledge and skill when it comes to the sales process. There's more to know about selling today than there ever has been. And we have to constantly update our knowledge. And probably the scariest thing that I've learned about sales is that without sales, business fails. And if you become a very good salesperson, the top 10% of salespeople in any field, whether that's you as the business owner, what happens is the top 10% earn 32 times more than the bottom 80%. So one, without sales, business fails, but the top 10% earn 32 times more than the bottom 80%. Oh my God. So, you know, the first one here, as I mentioned, people just don't know you exist. Yeah. Uh, I was in porn for 17 years. Uh, my mum was in porn, my dad was in porn, and we owned a very successful porn broking business. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on the main street in Windsor. Yeah. And we were there for 17 years. And probably about the 12th year of business, people would walk past and say, we didn't even know you were here. Oh and would say, what do you mean? Yeah. We're open five days a week. They said, we walk past your shop every day. We drive past the shop. We didn't even know you exist. We were driving 30 minutes across Sydney to get the exact same service. So this is visibility. People don't know you exist. This was our hometown. Isn't that incredible? So what we did, we had these big window displays and I got angry and I got out there and I got this bright fluoro orange and yellow paint and I painted the windows. One was bright orange, neon, and the other one was like a a high-vis vest yellow and then i put this big black lettering on there and it said instant cash loans oh. <laughs> as soon as i put that there the entire area knew what we did instant cash loans and the business started to double and triple its sales we had more people coming in wow. and at that stage we could have turned off the tap of all advertising because we have this saying in business you have to grow where you're planted and 80% of the people who can buy from you don't know you exist. And this is a problem that. with visibility. I love that. You have to grow where you're planted. I love that. That's fantastic. You've you got to grow. And even in a digital world, we make the mistake thinking just because we can speak to people in America and UK, we can do business with them. I, I've failed doing this. Um, I set up a business and I thought I'd be flying around the world, which I did. I had a huge client base in the UK, but every time I went to the UK, it would write me off for three weeks. I'd fly over there. I'd be jet lagged for the week. I'd deliver a presentation. I'd get acclimatized. 
And then by the time I got back to Australia, I was jet lagged for three weeks yep. and I lost three weeks worth of selling opportunities. Well, the opportunity cost was immense. Yeah. And my coach said to me, he said, Daniel, what are you trying to do? Flying from where you are all the way to the other side of the world. Yep. So one of the things I teach people now is to succeed in sales in a geographical region. Yep. Uh, I, I was born in Windsor and New South Wales. Uh, I've lived in Londonderry for you know, 39 years on and off. Um, I'm also an expatriate. And when I moved back to Australia in 2014, I couldn't find business in my hometown. So I thought, I know what will solve the problem. I'll move to Parramatta. <laughs> so I moved to Parramatta. And that week, the way the world works, all of my clients came from the Western suburbs. And I was driving back to Penrith almost every other day. Wow. <laughs> That's where my major business comes from, the Western suburbs of Sydney still today. Really? And this is because I've got to grow where I'm planted. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've had a similar experience. I thought, oh, yeah, I can, I'm a photographer. I can do work anywhere in Australia. So I started doing some um, uh, strategizing and advertising in Melbourne. And then I thought, you know what? I think I should just stick to Sydney. It's physically viable. I can travel. I can get around. Why expand too, too big? I've got the whole of the Sydney region. I think that'll do me. And I thought, you know, it makes just, just makes more sense. Uh, we were talk, uh, talking earlier on and you said, Daniel, is there any hints and tips for people? I'm going to give people one right now. Yep. The world's number one salesperson, uh, he holds a Guinness Book of Records for this. He made a decision in his life. He said, you know what? I don't want to be away from my family. I want to be home at 6 p.m. every single night to be with my family for dinner, to pick the kids up to school, to watch a bit of tea with them, to play a bit of ball. Yep. So what he did is he drew a circle uh, around his house, drew a big circle around and he drew a line. He said, I'm not going to travel any further than 80 kilometers away from my house every single day. He said, because if I can travel 80 kilometers and travel back, I can get there in 60 minutes and get back in 60 minutes. Yeah. Now with that geographical strategy, living in a hometown of 24,000 people, he was able to bring in in excess of $14 million per year in straight sales commissions. Wow. And he worked within an 80 kilometer radius of his house. Yep. And he holds a Guinness Book of Records. So imagine this. You draw a circle around Sydney, 80 kilometers. It'll take you down close to Wollongong. It'll take you close to Gosford. It'll take you all the way out to Katoomba. Yep. There are 6 million people there. Yep. There is yep. so much business there. Yep. And business you can come there. Home <laughs> every night and be with your family. Absolutely. And if you don't have family, if you've got cats, you can yep. come home and pat your cat. <laughs> <laughs> take the dog for a walk. <laughs> yeah, take the dog. <laughs> But I really, I love that. And just for the audience, again, you have to grow where you're planted. I think that's just a brilliant um, saying. And it just sums up, you know, we all just end up trying to get, trying to grow too big for, and to strategize too big for where we really are and where we need to be. And with the world as it is, it's global and technology is, is with us. We get excited and we get, we get dragged into other areas where we really don't need to go. So I think it's a really, really good strategy. Yep. 100%. Grow where you're planted. And we've, we've spoken about this for years. We've heard it from Earl Nightingale. He talked about acres of diamonds. You're standing on acres of diamonds, yep. but we just haven't trained our mind to see it. Going back to that patenting device of the mind, we don't have a pattern to see business where we are. We overlook opportunities. And there's a function of our mind called the reticular activation system. And, and it looks I love for it. a match of our most dominant thought. So if we get something in our head that says, I can't find business locally, what happens is you could be standing in the shopping center. Somebody could be talking about legal advice or looking for an accountant, looking for a bookkeeper, looking for a coach. And you will say, oh wow, those people must be looking for everybody except me. Yeah. These people would never buy me. And this little voice, this monkey on your back starts to say, that person's not talking about you. That's not your ideal client. And you'll just ignore it and you'll move on. And then because you get this thing in your mind that you can find business outside of your geographical region, you will actually find it yep. based on the law of attraction. You'll attract it to you. And then you'll have a self-fulfilling prophecy and you'll say, see, look, I told you there's no business around here. Yep. Yep. And then what will happen is you'll go chase it over there. And as soon as you're not paying attention to what's happening in the local area, business will come to you but you'll be so busy serving a geographical region. You'll be so fatigued because of all the travel and the time zones you're traveling through that you won't be able to service locally. Definitely. And it's almost like when you're going to go buy a car, you decide you're going to buy a Mazda. All of a sudden you start seeing the same model everywhere because you've 
activated that reticular activating system for the Mazda in your local area. So you can do the same with your business. Yep. And every conversation comes back to the Mazda. Yep, exactly. It doesn't matter if they say, hey, you've got to check out this new Lexus, but about uh, the Mazda. Mazda does this. Mazda does that. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Brilliant. So let's get into the meat and potatoes. I'm dying to know. How do we win sales in less than 30 minutes a day? What are some of the strategies that you help businesses put in place to do this? Well, we'll, we'll drop another little bomb here. The first one is grow where you're planted. Yep, great. And the second one is inch by inch, it's a cinch. Sorry, by the inch by inch, it's a cinch, but by the yard, it's hard. So when it comes to doubling your sales results, you have to understand the law of incremental improvement. And the law of incremental improvement says small improvements over time equal big improvements. And when we mentioned before about emotional intelligence, we talked about comfort zones. And we have to understand psychology, first of all. If you want to start to grow your sales, the thought of doubling your sales right now, it's such a big leap yeah. that it almost strikes fear into your heart and yeah. it almost makes you paralyzed. You think, oh my gosh, I would love to double my sales, but I just don't think it's possible for me. Yeah. And then you think about, oh my God, if I double my sales, the administration that I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to hire people. I'm, I've got to do more. I've got no time already, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to understand what happens first of all. So imagine your body temperature, we'll say it's roughly set to about 37 degrees. If your body temperature goes up by 10%, you go into what's called a hyperprexic state and the body gets so hot that it almost cooks itself. And if it cooks itself, it can fry the brain and you can die. And so what happens naturally, if we move up 10%, the body wants to cool us down and bring us back into that 37 degree comfort zone, homeostasis, gotcha. we can call it if we want to get medical. <laughs> if body temperature goes down by 10%, we go into a state of hypothermia and it's where the body gets cold and it freezes yeah. and we can die. So understanding homeostasis, if we go up by 10%, the body wants to bring us back down to 37 degrees. If we drop by 10%, and we're looking like the body could die, it wants to bring us back up to 37 degrees. But what you've noticed is it's just bringing us back to what is comfortable. It's, it's maintaining what happens, homeostasis all the time. That's maintaining all. homeostasis. So what happens is as soon as our income goes up by 10%, we start to go into what's called sabotaging behaviors. All of a sudden, we've got 10% more money and we go, gee whiz, what am I going to do with this money? I better spend it. So you go buy the Rolex, you go buy the Mazda, you go on a holiday and you spend this money and all of a sudden, your expenses have rise to make your new income. Yeah. And, and what you'll figure out- This is all subconscious. This is all subconscious. Yeah. So have a look. When you were 17, and you might have been earning 200 bucks a week, you had no money. Yeah. You're 25, you're earning 20 grand a year, and you still got no money. Yeah. You're now in your mid 30s, coming up 40s, you should be coming into the highest income earning years of your life. You're making more bank than you've ever had before, but you still got no money. <laughs> and this is because of homeostasis. Our income increases, and then our expenses increase, and we go into sabotaging behavior. This is, it's a very fascinating thing. The other thing is if our sales drop, by 10%, we go into scrambling behaviors. In a scrambling behavior, we try to get our income back up to where we were before. And what happens is we start to discount our services. Yeah. We start to give our products and service away. We start to add in these value adds and all of a sudden we get our income back up to where it was, but we're no more profitable because we've given so much of it away. That's right. So we're going to understand this. So when we talk about the law of incremental improvement, if we improve our sales results by 0.1% per day, we can actually double our sales results in 10 months. And what happens is you're just increasing the temperature by 0.1 of a percent. You're just increasing your sales results. And in 10 months, you will double your sales. Okay. So, this is what I do is I focus on one key area of my business. So most people talk about closing sales. They say, I'm having a problem closing sales. I'm not closing enough sales. I must have a closing problem. It's very rarely a closing problem. So for example, Darren, you might close one in 10 sales. 
So you've got a 10% closing ratio. So if you only have 10 people in your prospecting pipeline, you will only get one customer. So what we would say to a business here is if you want to double your sales and your, your closing rate is 10%, why don't you focus on bringing more customers into the business? So if you move from bringing 10 customers in and you start to bring in 10 prospects, you'll end up with two customers. Yep. If you bring in 30 prospects, you'll end up with three customers, even if your closing ratio at 10% stays the same. And could you also say the same thing conversely and say, if you worked on bringing your cost down by, 0.1, by an extra 0.1%, that would also help on the other side. Absolutely. So, you know, if you reduce your cost of acquisition, that'll make it cheaper. If you reduce the length of your sales cycle, that'll make it cheaper. Now, imagine you start to uh, increase the amount of prospects coming into your business. And let's say you get 100 leads every month and your, pro and your close rate is still at 10%. You now got 10 clients. But what happens if you bring in 100 prospects and then you take your closing ratio from 10% to 20%. Yep. Now you've got 20 clients. Right. And what happened if you took it up to a closing ratio where every 10 people you spoke to, three people bought? Now you've got 30 clients. Yep. So you can work on it in many different angles. But if you just focus on one key area of selling, which for most people, the problem is prospecting. And we said before, 80% of the population don't know who you are. Right. As soon as people know who you are, they start to flood to you. Yeah. And in my opinion, Darren, most people are pretty good at asking for the order, but they just don't have the opportunity to ask enough people. That's right. right. And if you improve by 0.1% per day, you can be half a percent better this week. You know, you can't lose a kilo of fat out of your body a day, yeah. but you can lose a hundred grams. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Everybody says, Hey, I can lose a hundred grams. Yeah. So, so small steps, baby steps. Small steps, 30 minutes a day. And what happens, we're talking about this 10% comfort zone. You're always within your comfort zone and you're just turning up the heat just a little bit and you don't even recognize it. And then you start to establish these new patterns. You remain comfortable, but you're comfortable getting better. Right. And then eventually you wake up one day and you're looking around and you go, my gosh, my business has grown twice the size. There's no panic. There's no anxiety. I've been able to do it and I'm comfortable. Because I've made small, slow, comfortable, incremental changes. Yep. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. Yep. By the yard, it's hard. You know that you could double your sales today, but could you handle it? Probably not. Yeah. But if you could do it just by 0.1% per day, everybody in the population says, you know, Daniel, I could do that. But the funny thing is, Darren, we turn around that people start to improve by 0.1%, not just in one key area, but they start to do it in multiple areas. And I have seen businesses double their sales results within 90 days. People taking their sales from $50,000 per month to in excess of $100,000 per month. My God. And they didn't have to grow the amount of staff coming to the business. Yep. They didn't have to put on more staff. They just became more effective. Yep. You know, this will blow your mind. Since 1939, the average salesperson spends less than 90 minutes a day face to face with customers. <laughs> so what do they do for the rest of the day? Drink coffee, read newspapers, surf Facebook. Yep. So one of the greatest things that you can do, and we're talking about things to make immediate improvements. If you just eliminate all the distractions and you spend twice as much time face to face with customers, you'll immediately double your sales. And everybody knows if you're only spending 90 minutes a day, which is an hour and a half, and you start to spend three hours in front of customers, you will double your sales. Yep. And you can manage your time to double your sales. Definitely. You don't have to learn anything. You just have to make a decision. If slow and steady, you'll be able to make it four hours or five hours a day, but slow and steady. Yep. Absolutely. And with all my research, 80% of your time should be spent face to face with people who can and will buy your products and services. Yep. And the world's most successful businesses spend 80% of their time face to face, nose to nose, chin to chin, belly to belly with prospects who can and will buy their products and services. Every business that is selling today, and this statistic has remained the same for 60 and 70 years, the businesses that fail, they spend less than 11% of their time each day face-to-face -face with people who can and will buy their products. Yes, 11%, that's nothing. 11%. Ridiculous, yeah, ridiculous.
incredible. <laughs> so can you double your sales? Absolutely. Can you do it in 30 minutes a day? Absolutely. You've just got to make sure you're using the right strategy at the right time. And it will happen uh, not by luck. It will happen by law. It's the law of cause and effect. If you do what other successful people do, you will get the exact same results. And if you don't, you won't. And I think as well, I think for me, listening to this, patience is also a big part of it because you want to do this slow and steady and you grow and you build your systems around you as you grow. So you need to be patient as well. If you try and change the world from one day to the next, everything will fall apart because it's too overwhelming. So patience is probably a good strategy to keep in, in mind while you're doing this. Yep. What I said to my wife when I met her, it, it goes like this. We date, we get engaged, we get married, then we have babies. But most people go from, <laughs> hello, you look nice at the bar and uh, pregnant by the end of the night. And that causes a lot of problems. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In, in Taiwan, um, you know, people call me Dan Dan because my name's uh, Danny Yu. So Dan Dan is a type of noodle. It's right. called a Dan Dan Mien. So when my wife fell pregnant, uh, we had to name the fetus, which was my daughter. So we called her uh, Bamien, which means right. cup noodle. <laughs> and then when um, she was pregnant with my son, uh, we called him uh, Chomien, which is fried noodle. Love it. So we went dating, engaged, married babies. But there's a lot of people out there with Paomien. And what Paomien <laughs> in Taiwan means is instant noodles. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Brilliant. <laughs> very, very good. Very, very good. I love it. So small steps, patience, and lots of noodles. <laughs> yep. And then you don't freak out. <laughs> you, so, don't, you don't turn your phone off on Father's Day. <laughs> absolutely. I love it. That's brilliant. <laughs> so, Daniel, um, have you got any case studies or uh, examples to share with us? I'd love to hear how you've like, physically put this in place and what were the results. There's three major things that we have to work on uh, in order to be successful. And this comes from the research done in the Carnegie studies. Now, knowledge is the foundation of everything. Once you acquire knowledge, you then can acquire new skills. You can't do it the other way around. And then you need to work on your attitude. So knowledge equates to about 7.5% of your success. This is why people spend tens of thousands of dollars every year going to university. They come out and they can't get jobs. Because knowledge alone doesn't contribute to success. What business owners say is they say, we want somebody with knowledge from university, but they must have five years of experience. Yeah, exactly. So people go to university and they go, but I just got all this information. Now I can't get a job. It's because they don't have skill. But in all the studies, skill only contributes to 7.5% of your success. Right. And what's happening in business today is business owners saying, we want somebody with knowledge. We want somebody with skill, but the most important thing for us is their attitude. And attitude, in my opinion, is the way that we approach a certain subject or topic. And it's our angle of attack. So in all the studies, attitude is 85% of our success. So a big company in Australia called Salmat Australia, they were having a problem communicating their unique selling proposition. And so they brought me in and they acquired some new knowledge about communication. We practiced the skill and enabled them to articulate their offer in a way that, that got close to their customer, but they could understand it. Right. And as a result of communicating it, their customer said, I want that. And in 90 days, their sales increased by 75%. Whoa, whoa. And we're talking about a $450 million company here. Right, right. And they just had to learn to articulate they're off a better. Yep. So they acquired just knowledge. Small step, skill just a little tweak. That's all it was. Didn't, sh didn't change the product. Yep. Didn't change the service. Did not change the people. Yep. They just changed the approach. Yep. Didn't even change the amount of prospects. Just changed the message. That's it. Yep. Incredible. That's it. Little things. Mm -hmm. There was also Ray White. Australia. Now, these guys are some of the most popular real estate agents in the country. And their Glen Roy office uh, was led by a gentleman by Matt Caron and Zia Coxall. And they were excellent real estate agents. They were excellent in property management, but they'd never run a business. And Mette moved out from um, property management into sales. And so he went 
in, great guy, nice guy, great attitude, but he just didn't know how to position himself correctly in the sales process. So he was going out and he would see seven prospects, but he'd lose six deals and come home with one. And that was incredibly frustrating. So his closing ratio was one out of seven. So the only way to increase his sales, in his opinion, was to go out and see more people. So if he wanted to make two sales, he had to lose 12. That's right. My God. And so all he could do was increase the numbers. But what happened was he was getting exhausted and you run out of hours in the day. So we had a look at his sales approach and we realized that it was in his first connection that he was losing the business. So he had to learn how to develop rapport more effectively. And then he had to ask different questions to his customers. And this guy was very coachable. He had a dream to be the best. And this is the important thing is you've got to have a dream to be the best. And he was open to coaching and he said, Daniel, I will learn whatever I need to learn to be able to hit and achieve and then exceed my goals. So he learned how to build rapport more effectively. He came and trained with me. He learned how to articulate his offer. And then he went back and he would see seven people. But this time he would win six sales, wow. present seven times, win six times. And he continued doing that over an 18 month period. And over 18 months, sales results went up 250%. There you go. There you go. And this was such a ground, it was such a breakthrough in the industry that they talked about this story in the top real estate magazine called Real Estate Business right. Magazine. And there was a full case study on it there because they, they're wondering how can somebody outside of the industry come in and teach somebody how to increase sales by 250%? Oh, wow. I did not teach him about real estate. Yep. I gave him the knowledge and the skill and helped him work on that attitude, that approach yep. to sales. So and attitude was the key. He needed to have that attitude to allow him to take on board what you were going to teach him and actually execute on it. Excellent. And he, and he did. And he was a phenomenal young guy. And, you know, he says to everybody, it's possible. You've just got to learn to do something new. And they had big goals. And today, credit, uh, and, you know, the hats off to Metcar and, and Z Coxall. They went from having 1% market share in their area and seven employees they now have 9.4% market share and have more than 23 employees in 18 months. And here's the kicker. They are now the number one real estate agents in Victoria for Ray White. Whoa, incredible. They didn't learn anything about real estate. They just learned about emotional intelligence yep. and how to approach sales differently. Definitely. And emotional intelligence is such a, it's talked about a lot these days, but it, I can't stress the importance of that. You know, you have to really do the work. It's about self-awareness, about awareness of others. And you have to do all that work from that point of view as well, because that really makes a huge difference these days. Yeah. And talking about strategies with emotional intelligence, a one point improvement in your emotional intelligence, and this is what I specialize in, will see an increase of sales by 2%. So you increase your emotional intelligence by one point, sales go up 2%. two percent. So you met Car and he increased his emotional intelligence by 25 points and sales went up 250%. And what we do here in my business is we measure people's level of emotional intelligence. We then show them where they need to improve it. And within 60 to 90 days, sales results go through the roof. A real estate agent by the name of Charlie Lund she worked with me for a period of 18 months okay. and she improved her emotional intelligence by uh, 50%, which is, you know, it's only a small amount. Went up by 50% and her sales went up by $50,000 per month. Wow. And now she's the number two agent in the country. Okay. So, I mean, when I hear this, it's all just, it's cause and effect. It's a formula. There's no magic to this. It's just about doing the work and knowing where to tweak, where to put that 0.1 or 1% effort in to tweak, and it, the results will be there. There's no way that they can't appear. It's a formula. Yep. yep. Spot so on. You have to do the work. <laughs> yep. All right. 100%. Oh, fantastic. So um, before we um, sign off, I mean, we've, we've touched on a few little absolute nuggets of gold in terms of tips for people. Are there any um, extra little tips or insights that people might be able to put in place straight away after hearing this um, this episode? 
I, I mentioned a client of mine by the name of James Lavelle. And he's got a great quote. He says, how can a man with no brain earn more than a brain surgeon? <laughs> this guy is a self-made millionaire. He lives in a mansion. He drives a Range Rover, but he was born into poverty. He grew up in a council estate. Uh, he lost his dad at a young age. His first job, he says, he worked in the bacon factory. And that's where they slaughtered pigs. Uh, at about uh, 15, 16, he joined the army because that's the only way out of the council estate. Uh, he joined the army, got into business and became a self-made millionaire. And, you know, what James said was, how can a man with no brain earn more than a brain surgeon? Well, James did three things. And we mentioned this before. He gets in front of the right people. 80% of the population don't know you exist. And the biggest opportunity for you in business right now is your non-customer. That's where the biggest opportunity lies. And that's what I specialize in, putting my customers in front of new people. The second thing is credibility. And it takes credibility to get the appointment and it takes mega credibility to get the sale. And I own about 10 pages on Google. I own YouTube, I own social media and I'm everywhere. And what you've got to do is you've got to get your face out there and you have to get on podcasts like this and share your story. Because if people look for you and they can't find you on the internet, you're a ghost and people don't like ghosts. <laughs> ghosts are scary yeah. and you don't want to live in a haunted house. So <laughs> you've got to get mega credibility. And the third thing that you can work on immediately is your sales systems. Remember, without sales, business fails. The level of sales that you make determine the car you drive. They determine the house you live in. They determine how much money you take home. The amount of sales determines your reputation in your marketplace. And if you don't have a great reputation, you'll never succeed. And if you don't make enough sales, enough people won't know about you. And without sales, business fails. And they're the three things that people have to focus on right now. And if they master those three areas and get the right help, they'll become ultimately successful. Absolutely outstanding. I mean, I've, I've, I've been fascinated by all these insights that you've given us. So you've given me a lot to think about. And, you know, for everybody out there, again, it's about small, small incremental steps, but doing them consistently, being patient, working on your EQ, and the results have no choice but to show up because it's a formula. But you have to do the work. My, my wife asked me one day, she said, Daniel, why are you more successful than other coaches? And I thought about it and I said, well, I'm like a photographer. She said, what do you mean? I said, I always remain focused. I love it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> very, very nice. So, Daniel, I mean, really huge thank you for being on the show today. I had a lot of fun and I'm, hopefully we can possibly do another one. So if the audience has some other questions or you know, other angles that you'd like Daniel to, to give you some more insight onto and tackle, then I'd love to have Daniel back on the show. So feel free to email some questions through. But if people want to get in contact with you, Daniel, what's the best way for them to do that? Best way, you can go to my website, www.winsalesnow.com and download my new book called Win Sales Now. Get it, it's free. Just put in your email address and get it for free. And there's 21 strategies in there. Download that. And if you'd like to speak to me personally, reach out. Uh, you know, in Australia, what we've come accustomed to is we think asking for help is a dirty word. We think asking for help is a sign of weakness. But I want to let you know, the most successful people put their hand up and they say, I need some help over here. And asking for help is a sign of strength. So I'd ask you to write to me personally, daniel at danieltolson.com and ask a question and I will respond personally, guaranteed. Fantastic. And again, you know, it boils down to attitude. You know, if, you're the, if you have the attitude that you want to learn and you're open to learning, then all the resources and people to help you do that are there. 100%. It's all about the attitude. So Daniel, once again, thank you very much. We had a great show and uh, I can't wait to um, have you on again. Let's do it again. Thanks, Darren. Thanks again.